We'll continue reading The Guardian by Nicholas Sparks. This is chapter 35. Within 40 minutes, Richard Franklin's home was crowded with Swansboro police officers and Onslow County sheriffs. The four and sixteen from Jacksonville was inside, collecting fingerprints and looking for evidence of Andrea's presence. Jennifer and Pete were standing outside the home with their captain, Russell Morrison, a gruff bulldozer of a man with thinning gray hair and eyes set too close together. He had them repeat their story twice, then listened as Jennifer filled him in on what she'd already learned. When she finished, Morrison just kept shaking his head. He had been born and raised in Swansboro and regarded himself as his protector. The night before, he'd been, on, he'd been one of the first to arrive at the scene where Andrea had been found, even though he'd been sound asleep when he'd received the call at home. This is the same guy that Mike Harris assaulted in the bar, the one Julie claimed was stalking her? Yes, Jennifer said, but you don't have any concrete evidence linking him to this crime. Not yet. Have you talked to Andrea's neighbors to see if they've seen him around? No, we came here right after the salon. S Russell Morrison considered what he'd been told. Just because he ran doesn't mean he's the one who assaulted Andrea. Neither does anything you've learned about him. But Morrison held up his hands to cut her off. I'm not saying I think he's innocent. Hell, he tried to kill an officer. And that doesn't happen on my watch. He glanced at Pete. You sure you're okay? Yeah, pissed off, but I'm okay. Good. You're the lead on this investigation, but I'm going to put everyone on it. Pete nodded as they were interrupted by a shot from Fred Burrs, one of the officers who'd been in the house. He was approaching them rapidly. Captain, he called out. Morrison turned toward him. Yeah? Morrison turned toward him. Yeah? I think we've got something, he announced. What is it? Blood, he said simply. Henry's beach house was on Topsail Island. A slit of land half a mile offshore, about 40 minutes from Swansboro, covered by rolling dunes speckled with sawgrass and white sand. The island was popular with families during the summer, though few people lived there year-round. During spring, visitors seemed to have the island all to themselves. Like all homes there, the main floor of the house had been built above the garage and storage areas due to storm surges. Steps led from the back porch to the beach, and the windows along the back of the house offered an um, unobstructed view of the waves as they rolled in. Julie stood at the window, staring at their ceaseless motion. Even here, it was impossible for her to relax or feel safe. She and Mike had stopped at the grocery store along the way, buying enough food to last them a week. Then they swung by Walmart to grab enough basic clothing to get them through the next few days. Neither of them had any idea how long they would be here, and she didn't want to go out in public unless she had to. The drapes were drawn in every window but this one. Mike had parked Emma's car in the garage so it couldn't be seen from the road. As they were driving, he had taken Henry's advice and exited the highway three times, circling through neighborhood streets, constantly checking the rearview mirror. No one had followed them. They were sure of that. Still, Julie couldn't shake the feeling that Richard would somehow find her. Behind her, Mike was putting the groceries away, and Julie could hear the sound of cabinets as they were opened and closed. Maybe they've already caught him, Mike offered. Julie said nothing. Singer moved beside her and nuzzled her hip. Julie's hand went automatically to his head. You okay? No, she said. Not really. Mike nodded. Stupid question. I hope Andrea's okay, he said. When she didn't respond, Mike looked up. We're safe here, he said. You know that, right? There's no way he could know we're here. I know. But she wasn't so sure and her fear was so strong that she found herself instinctively backing away from the window. At her movement, Singer's ears rose to attention. What is it? Mike asked. Julie shook her head. On the beach, she could see two couples walking near the water's edge, headed in opposite directions. Both had walked by the house without a glance only minutes before. There is no one else out there. Nothing, she said finally. It's a beautiful view, isn't it? Julie lowered her gaze. To be honest, she hadn't noticed. Morrison huddled with the officers outside Richard's house as he took charge, outlining what was happening and what he wanted done. Jacksonville police and the sheriff's department are looking for the car now to see if we can find this guy, he said. But in the meantime, this is what I need you to do. He pointed from one man to the next as he spoke. 
Her Herald Sun Interior, I need you to head down to the bridge and talk to anyone on the crew who might know some of this guy's hangouts, where he goes, who his friends are, what he likes to do. Thomas, I need you to stay here with forensics while forensics gathers evidence. Make sure they tag and bag everything. This one has to go by the book. Burris, I want you to go to Andrea's apartment and talk to the neighbors. I want to know if anyone else has seen this guy at her place. Johnson, likewise for you. I need you to head to Moorhead City to find out if anyone else can verify that Andrea and Richard Franklin were together. Puck, I need you to find out who else Andrea has been seeing who might have done this. It's probable that we have the guy already, but you know how defense attorneys are. You have to look into every possible suspect. He turned to Jennifer and Pete, and you too. I want you to find out everything we can about this guy. Everything. And see what you can learn about Jessica too. I want to talk to her if we can. What about the subpoena for J.D. Blanchard? Jennifer asked. Morrison met her eyes. Let me handle that. Like, Ju like Julie and Mike, Richard Franklin stopped at the store. After pulling his car into the rear corner parking lot of the hospital where it wouldn't draw attention by remaining parked in the same spot for a few days, he grabbed the bags from the store and walked down the block before heading into the gas station restroom. He locked the door behind him, staring into the grimy mirror above the sink. He became his methodical self again. In the plastic bags were items necessary for the change he had gone through once before. A razor, scissors, hair coloring, tanning cream, and a pair of inexpensive reading glasses. Not much, but enough to alter his appearance from a distance. Enough to hide in plain view for the short term. Enough to find her. There was, however, the problem of where she'd gone. And she was gone. Of that he was not certain. No one had answered the phone at the salon, and when he'd called the garage, one of Henry's flunkies had said that Mike had left as well. So she'd run, but where? Richard smiled, knowing he'd have to answer soon. Even when people tried to be careful, they made mistakes, and her mistake, he was certain, came down to this. Someone knew exactly where she was. Henry or Emma or Mabel probably knew, and the police would know as well. They'd want to talk to her, tell her what they'd learned to keep their eye on her. One of these people, he was certain, would lead him to her doorstep. He whistled softly under his breath as he began to alter his appearance. Thirty minutes later, he emerged into the sunlight, blonder, tanner, wearing glasses and without a mustache. A new man. All that's left is to find another car, he thought. He headed down the street toward the mall across from the hospital. Back at the station, Jennifer's first call was to the Denver Police Department, which she was passed from person to person until finally reaching Detective Cohen. She told him who she was and about the investigation as she spoke. She heard the detective whistle under his breath. Yeah, he said. I'll see what I can do. I'm not, on my, I'm not at my desk, so let me call you back in a few minutes. After hanging up, she glanced at Pete. He was on the phone to various airlines in the Jacksonville Relay, Relay and Wilmington airports, trying to find out if Richard had indeed traveled out of town when he, had let, when he had told Julie he was at his mother's funeral. If so, they wanted to know where he'd gone, in the hope it would lead them to someone who could tell them about him. Morrison was in his office, serving as the hub of information, as information came in from the other officers. Thomas had caught a few minutes earlier. He said that the forensics team had found evidence of semen stains on the sheets, and they were scouring the bed for additional evidence. When Cohen called back, Jennifer picked up on the first ring. We've got information on a few Richard Franklins, he said. It's not an unusual name, so more than one popped up in the system. Tell me about him. Jennifer gave him a brief description, height and weight, hair color and eyes, approximate age, race. Okay, give me just a second. On the phone, she could hear him tapping information to the computer. Huh? He finally said. What? He hesitated. I don't think we have any information for you. Nothing? Not even an arrest? Not based on what you told me. We have records of seven individuals with the name Richard Franklin. Four of these... Four of those are African Americans. One is deceased, one is in his 60s. What about the last one? A typical druggie. He's about the same age as your guy, but nothing else about him matches up. There's not a chance he could pass for an engineer, even for a day. He's been in and out of prison for the last 20 years, and from our records, he never lived at the address you listed. Is there anything else? King Track County records, or maybe records from other cities? It's all in here, Cohen said. Sounding as disappointed as she did, 
The system was just updated a couple of years ago. We have information to any, on anyone arrested in the state going back to 1977. If he'd been arrested anywhere in the state of Colorado, we know it. Jennifer tapped her pencil on the pad. Could you fax me a photograph of the last guy anyway, or attach it to an email? Sure, but I don't think he's your guy, Cohen said. His tone dropping slightly, he paused. Look, if you need anything else, let me know. Sounds like a pretty bad guy. Not the kind you want wanting... We want walking around in public. After hanging up the phone, Jennifer placed a call to the Columbus Police Department, hoping for better luck. Mabel had left the salon that morning and driven to the hospital. Now she was sitting beside Andrea in the intensive care unit, holding her hand and hoping that Andrea would somehow know she was there. You're going to be okay, sweetheart, she whispered. Almost to herself, your mom and dad are going to be here soon. The heart monitor beeped steadily in response, and Mabel eyed the phone. She wished she knew what was going on with the investigation. For a moment, she considered calling Pete Gandy to find out, but she was still so mad at him for letting this go on as long as it had that she didn't think she could do so without screaming at him. Mike had been right. All he'd had to do was listen to Julie, and none of this would have happened. Why had that been so hard? How on earth had he ever passed training? Mabel heard the sound of footsteps approaching and looked up to see the nurse. She had been checking in every 20 minutes to monitor any changes. The first 24 hours were critical, the doctor had said. If Andrea was going to come out of a coma without brain damage, more than likely she'd show some improvement by then. Mabel's throat tightened as she watched the nurse in action checking vital signs and scribbling notes. By the look on her face, Mabel knew there was no change at all. Jennifer hung up with the Columbus Police Department just as Morrison came out of his office. Got the subpoena, he said. Judge Riley signed it a few minutes ago, and it's being faxed to J.D. Blanchard right now. We should have the information shortly unless they get their legal team involved and try to stall things. Jennifer noticed Bo was unable to hide the information in her expression. Still no luck, Morrison asked. She shook her head. Nothing. Not a damn thing. He hasn't so much as had a speeding ticket in either Colorado or Ohio. No arrests, no record of him even being a suspect in a crime. The facts from Denver didn't help. Not our guy. Not even close. She scanned the facts photograph anyway. I don't understand it. A guy like this doesn't just appear out of nowhere. I know he's done this type of thing before. There's got to be some record of it. She ran a hand through her hair. Any news from the house? It seems as if he did some cleaning recently. They were able to bag a few things, but he won't know for sure of, if any of it's of use until they examine. Right now, we have some someone running a blood sample down to Wilmington. The department there has one of the best labs in the state, and as soon as they get both samples, they'll run a comparison with Andrea's blood from the hospital. It's number one on the priority list, and hopefully we'll get a match. Blood type checks out, though. Andrea is A positive, and so is the sample. It's not as common as O, so it seems likely that he's our guy. Anything from Moorhead or the workers at the site? Not so far. Franklin seemed to keep to himself. Harrelson and Teeter couldn't find anyone who liked the guy, let alone hung out with him. Nobody even knew where he lived. There's, they've still got a few, peop few more people to talk to, but they're not very hopeful. As for Burris and Puck, they said that no one can remember seeing Franklin anywhere near Andrea's apartment but they're getting information on other possible suspects, just in case. She tended to associate with some pretty rough guys, and Puck is gathering their names now. Richard Franklin's our guy, Jennifer reiterated. Morrison held up his hands as if he realized that. We'll know that for sure in a couple of hours, he said. As for Moorhead City, Johnson is showing Andrea's picture around. Good idea to grab that photo, by the way, but so far nothing. There are a lot of bars and restaurants to cover, and they just got there a little while ago. Evening shifts in the bars and restaurants start about five, so it might take a while. Jennifer nodded. Morrison nodded toward the phone. Have you been able to check down any information on Jessica yet? No, she said. Not yet. That's my next step. Julie sat on the couch with Singer by her side, one ear cocked forward. Mike turned on the television and surfed through the channels, then turned it off. He wandered through the house, making sure the front door was locked, then looked through the window up and down the street. Quiet. Completely quiet. I think I'll give Henry a call, he finally said, just to let him know we made it. Julie nodded. 
Pulling back her hair with both hands, Jennifer turned her attention to the photographs that had been in Richard's briefcase. Unlike Julie, Jessica appeared to have posed happily for most of them. It almost seemed likely that she was indeed his wife. Jennifer noted that in a few pictures, there was an engagement ring, which was later joined to a wedding band. Unfortunately, the photographs couldn't tell her anything about Jessica herself, if indeed that was her name. None had information written on the back that might reveal a maiden name or even where they were taken. The photographs themselves showed no landmarks, and after a cursory glance through them, Jennifer wondered how to find out more about her. She searched the in internet for any mention of Jessica Franklin, looking for the obvious anyone from Colorado or Ohio, for instance, and checked out the sites that posted a photograph. There were less than a handful of those, and none matched the woman she was looking for. It didn't surprise her. After a divorce, most women would go back to the maiden names. But what if they hadn't divorced? He'd already demonstrated how violent he could be. Jennifer looked at the phone. After hesitating for just a moment, she dialed Detective Cohen in Denver. No, no problem, he said in response to her request. Since you caught, I've been thinking about that guy. For some reason, his name sounds familiar. This shouldn't be too hard to find out. Let me check. She waited as he checked the records. No, he finally said. No murder victims listed under the name of Jessica Franklin. No missing persons either. Is there any way you could find out anything about their marriage, when it took place, how long they've been married? We don't have that kind of information on hand, but the county might. Your best bet is to look through property tax records, since most homes are owned in both names, and that might help you get started. But you'll need to find someone who can access the archives, and that's, of course, assuming they were married in the, in the area. Do you have the number? Not offhand, but let me look it up. She heard him pull open a door, cursed, and called to one of his colleagues for a book. A moment later, he recited the number, and Jennifer was drawing it down as Pete came rushing to her desk. Daytona, he said. The son of a bitch went to Daytona when he said he went to his mother's funeral. Daytona? Isn't that where Julie is from? I don't remember, Pete said quickly, but listen. If his mother died, we might be able to find some information about her in a recent obituary. I've already accessed the newspaper, and I'm printing up the information now. Pretty smart, huh? Jennifer said nothing as she thought about it. Don't you think that's odd, she asked. I mean, his mother dying in the same place Julie grew up. Maybe they grew up together. Possible, but unlikely, she thought, shaking her head. It just didn't sound right, especially considering that there was proof he'd been in Denver four years ago, and Julie certainly would have mentioned any common history they shared. But why would he go to Daytona? Suddenly, she paled. Do you have a phone number for Julie's mother, she asked. Pete shook his head, no. Get it. I think we should talk to her. But what about the arbitories? Forget them. We're not even sure the story about his mother is true, let alone his phone records instead. Let's get his phone records instead. Maybe we can find out what, who he called. I should have done that from the beginning, she realized suddenly. So much for thinking she knew everything. Phone records? From the house, Pete. Get the phone records for Richard Franklin. Pete blinked, trying to keep up. So the arbitraries don't mean anything. No, he didn't go down there to see his mother. He went down there to learn about Julie. I'd bet my life on it. Henry sat with Emma at the kitchen table, his eyes absently following a fly that was bouncing against the glass. So they're sure no one followed them. Henry nodded. That's what Mike said when he called. And do you think they're safe? I hope so, but until they catch this SOB, I won't rest easy. What if they don't? They'll find him. But what if they don't, Emma asked again. How long are they going to have to hide there? Henry shook his head. As long as it takes, he paused. But I should probably call and let the police know where they are. Jennifer absently twirled the strand of hair as she finished up her conversation with Henry. Thanks for letting me know, she said. I appreciate it. Goodbye. So they left town, she thought, hanging up. On the one hand, she probably would have done the same thing if she'd been in their situation. On the other hand, they were farther away if they needed help. Though Topso was still in the country, in the county, it was at the southern end, at least 40 minutes from Swansboro. The arch of tax records had been a dead end. The house had been listed in Richard Franklin's name only. Without any place else to turn for information, Jennifer returned her focus to the photographs. Photographs she knew could tell her about not only the subject, but the photographer as well. And Richard had been quite good, had been quite 
good. Many of the images were striking, and she found herself staring out at them. Richard Franklin, she decided, wasn't simply a weekend photographer, but someone who viewed photography as art. It made sense, considering the equipment they found in his house. It wasn't something she had focused on right away, but could that knowledge be helpful? And if so, how? She wasn't sure yet. Still, the longer she looked, the more she felt that she was on the right track with this line of thinking. So she wasn't ex sure exactly what the answers were yet, or even the questions for that matter. As she stared at the photographs and wondered what they implied about Richard, she couldn't help but feel that she was getting close to something important. 36. In Denver, Detective Larry Cohen thought about the phone calls. Officer Romanello had wanted information on Richard Franklin. And though he'd searched the database without success, he knew he'd heard the name before. As he told Jennifer Romanello, the name was familiar. Could have been anything, of course. A witness in one of the hundreds of cases he'd been involved with. He may even have seen the name in the newspaper at one time or another. Might even have been a stranger he'd bumped into at a party or someone he'd met in passing. Yet he had a feeling that the name had something to do with police business. If he hadn't been arrested, though, what was it? Rising from his desk, he decided to ask around. Maybe someone else in the department would be able to clear it up for him. An hour later, Morrison emerged from his office with both the phone records and the information from J.D. Blanchard that Richard Franklin had originally submitted. Included in the facts was his resume and information about the previous projects on which he'd consulted. P. took the phone records, Jennifer put the photographs aside and began studying the information from J.D. Blanchard. At the top of the resume, Richard had listed an apartment in Columbus as an address. Below that, however, was a gold mine, whom he'd worked for and when association list previous experience, his educational background. Got you, she whispered. After calling information, she dialed Lanchy Construction in Cheyenne, Wyoming, the last company he'd worked for before forming his own corporation. After identifying herself to the receptionist, she was passed on to Clancy Edwards, the vice president, who'd been with the company almost 20 years. Richard Franklin? Sure, I remember him. Edwards offered almost immediately. He was one hell of a manager here. Really knew his stuff. I wasn't surprised when he went into business for himself. When was the last time we talked to him? Oh, gee, let me think about that. He moved to Denver, you know. I guess it must have been eight or nine years ago. We were working on, oh, let's see, that would have been in 95, right? I think it was a project out in, excuse me, Mr. Edwards, but do you know if he was married? It took a moment for Edwards to realize she had asked another question. Married? Yes, was he married? Edwards laughed under his breath. Not a chance. We were all pretty sure he was gay. Jennifer paused the phone closer to her ear, pushed the phone closer to her ear, wondering if she'd heard him right. Wait. Are you sure? Well, not a hundred percent. Not that he ever said anything about it, of course. We didn't push it either. A man's personal business is his own, as long as he can do the job. That's always been the way we work. We do a good job with affirmative action at our company. Always have. Jennifer barely listened as he went on. We always come a long way. But it's not San Francisco, if you know what I mean. And it wasn't always easy. But times are changing, even here. Did he get along with everyone, she suddenly asked, remembering what Jake Blanton had told her on the phone. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I said, he really knew his stuff, and people respected him for it. And he was a nice guy, too. Bought my wife a hat for her birthday. Not that she wears it much anymore. You know how women are about. How about the construction workers? Did he get along with them? Caught in mid-sentence, Clancy Edwards took another moment to catch up. Yeah, sure, them too. Like I said, everyone liked him. A couple might have had a problem with his, well, his personal life, but everyone got along with him fine. We were all sorry to see him go. When Jennifer said nothing, Edward seemed to feel the need to fill silence. Can I ask what this is all about? He's not in trouble, is he? Nothing happened to him, did it? Jennifer was still trying to make sense of this new information. It's regarding investigation. I'm sorry, but I can't say anymore, she answered. Do you remember if you ever received a call from an outfit called J.D. Blanchard regarding a reference? I didn't, but I think the president did. We were happy to give a recommendation. Like I said, he did a real good job. Jennifer found her gaze drifting to the photographs of Jessica again. 
Do you know if he was into photography as a hobby? Richard? He might have been, but if he was, he never mentioned it to me. Why? No reason, she said, suddenly running out of questions. I want to thank you for your time, Mr. Edwards. If I need any more help, would you mind if I call you again? No, not at all. You can reach me until six on most days. We have a lot of respect for law enforcement around here. My gramps used to be sheriff for, oh gee, I guess it must have been 20 years or so. Even as he was speaking, Jennifer was hanging up the phone, shaking her head and wondering why none of what she'd just heard seemed to make any sense. You were right, Pete said to Jennifer a few minutes later, looking confused as she'd been right about her instincts, while his had been so off base. There was a number listing a private investigator in Detona. He glanced at the note he scribbled. Richard made three calls to an outfit called Croom's Investigations. No answer when I dialed it, but I left a message. Sounds like a one-man shop. No secretary and a man's voice on the answering machine. How about Julie's mother? Pete shook his head. Yeah, I got her number through information, but there is no answer. I'll try again in a little while. How's it going on your end? Jennifer briefed him on her conversation with Clancy Edwards. When she'd finished, Pete scratched the back of his neck. Gay, huh? He nodded as if it made sense. I can see that. Jennifer reached for the resume again, trying to ignore his comments. I'm going to try the next company on the list, she said. It's been a long time since he's worked there, but I'm hopeful that I can talk to somebody who remembers him. After that, I guess I'll try the bank in Denver where he kept his accounts. Maybe I can get some information from some of his former neighbors. If I can locate any of them, that is. That sounds like it'll take a while. Jennifer nodded, distracted, still thinking about the call to Edwards. Listen, she said, scribbling down the basic information from the resume. While I'm doing that, see if you can find out anything about his childhood. It says he was born in Seattle, so call the major hospitals and see if you can find the record of his birth certificate. Maybe we can find out more if you hunt down his family. I'll keep working on this end. Sure. Oh, and keep trying the detective and Julie's mother. I really want to talk to them. You got it. It took more time than he'd imagined it would to find the car, but Richard exited the parking lot of the mall in a green 1994 Pontiac Trans Am. Turning into traffic, he headed for the highway. As far as he could tell, no one was watching him. It was ridiculous in this day and age, he thought, that people still left their keys in the ignition. Didn't they realize that someone would take advantage of their stupidity? No, of course not. Those things could never happen to them. It was a world of Pete Gandys out there. Blind and lazy morons who left us vulnerable to terrorists, not only with their stupidity, but with their lack of vigilance. Their fat, contented ignorance. He would never be so careless, but he wasn't complaining. He needed a car, and this one would do just fine. The afternoon wore on. In the course of her calls, Jennifer had come across one dead end after another. Finding neighbors had been all but impossible. She had to convince a county worker to go through the property tax records to find the owners. And then find the names to information. All the while hoping they hadn't moved and that took more time than she thought it would. In the course of four hours, she talked to four people, all of whom had known Richard Franklin at one time. Two were former neighbors and two were managers who vaguely remembered Richard Franklin from the single year he'd spent working for a company in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Like Edwards, all four had said essentially the same things about Richard Franklin. He was a nice guy who got along with everyone. Probably gay. If, this, if his hobby was photography, they didn't know about it. Jennifer stood from her desk and made her way across the station to get another cup of coffee. Who was this guy? She wondered, and why on earth did it feel as if everyone had been describing someone else entirely? Halfway across the country, Detective Larry Cohen discussed the situation with a few people in the department. Like him, they recognized the name but couldn't place it. One had gone so far as to look up the same information that Cohen had, convinced that he must have had a record only to get exactly the same results. Frowning, Cohen thought about it as he sat at his desk. Why was the name so familiar? Familiar not only to him but to everyone here. If he'd never been arrested and no one could remember using him as a witness, he bolted upright as the answer suddenly came to him. After tapping the keyboard on his computer, he scanned the basic information that came up on his screen. He 
he hunch confirmed his hunch confirmed. He rose from his seat to find the detective he had to talk to. At his desk, Pete was having more luck. He'd finished collecting the information on the early period of Richard's life, none of which was difficult to find. Feeling rather proud, he was heading over to phone Jennifer when her phone rang. She held up a finger for Pete to wait until she was finished. Swansboro Police Department, Jennifer said, Officer Romanello speaking. She heard a throat clear on the other end. This is this is Detective Cohen from Denver. Jennifer sat up. Oh, hey, did you find anything? Sort of. After your call, I kept thinking how familiar the name Richard Franklin sounded. So I asked around the department before it finally hit me where I'd heard it before. He paused. After that, one of the other detectives here told me something rather interesting. It concerned a case he investigated four years ago about a missing person. Jennifer reached for a pen. Jessica Franklin? Pete glanced at Jennifer when he heard Jessica's name. No, not about Jessica. Then who are you talking about? Richard Franklin, the guy you called me about? Jennifer paused. What are you trying to say? Richard Franklin, Detective Cohen said slowly. He's the missing person. But he's here. I understand that. But four years ago, he vanished. He didn't show up at work one day, and after a week or so, his secretary finally contacted us. I talked to the detective in charge of the investigation. From all appearances, he said it looked like the guy suddenly took off. Clothes were on the bed, and the drawers looked rifled through. Two suitcases were missing. His secretary told us they were the ones he always used on business. And his car was gone, too. He'd made a cash withdrawal from an ATM the last day that anyone saw him. He ran. Seemed so. Why? That's what the detective couldn't figure out. From the interviews with Franklin's acquaintances, no one can figure it out. They said he wasn't the type who would simply take off and leave his business behind. No one could understand it. And there wasn't any legal trouble. None that the, de that the detective could find. There weren't any lawsuits pending, and as I told you before, he wasn't in any trouble with us. It's like he simply decided to start over. It was the same thought Jennifer had had when she'd seen his credit report, she remembered. Why didn't this? Why didn't his family report it? Well, that's the thing. There really wasn't any family to speak of. His father was deceased, he had no siblings, and his mother was in a nursing home and suffering from dementia. Jennifer considered the implications. Do you have any information you could send me on the case? Sure, I've already pulled the file. I can FedEx you. I can FedEx it tomorrow, and after I make copies. Is there any way you could fax it over? It's a thick file, he said. It'll take at least an hour to get it all to you. Please, she said. I am probably going to be here all night anyway. Yeah, he said. I can do that. Give me your fax number again. Beyond the window above the kitchen table in Henry's beach house, the ocean was glowing orange as the fire had been set beneath the surface. As the last traces of the day began to vanish, the kitchen slowly grew dimmer. The overhead light buzzed with a fluorescent hum. Mike moved close to Julie as she watched Singer on the beach. He was lying in the sand, ears up, head swiveling occasionally from side to side. Are you ready to eat yet? he asked. I'm not hungry. Mike nodded. How's Singer doing? He's fine. No one's out there, you know, Mike said. Singer would let us know. Julie nodded and leaned into Mike as he slipped his arms around her. Morrison left his office, striding toward Jennifer and Pete. It's Andrea Bradley's blood, all right. Just got off the phone with the lab and they confirmed it. No doubt about it. Jennifer barely heard him. Instead, she was staring at the first page that had come through the facts from Denver. And Johnson found the witness, Morrison went on. Turns out that one of the bartenders at Mosquito Grove remembered Andrea from the other night. Gave a perfect description of Richard Franklin. Said the guy was a real jerk. Jennifer was still staring at the first page from the facts, ignoring the other pages as they came through. It's not Richard Franklin, she said quietly. Morrison and Pete looked at her. What are you talking about? Morrison asked. The suspect, she said quietly. His name isn't Richard Franklin. The real Richard Franklin has been missing for three years. Here, she said, handing over the first page of the facts. It was a photograph of the missing person and the despite... And despite the fuzziness of the fax picture, the bald head and heavy features made it so clear to her that it wasn't the man they'd been looking for. This just came from came in from Denver. 
This is the real Richard Franklin. Morrison and Pete looked at the picture. Pete blinked in confusion. This is Richard Franklin, he asked. Yes. Pete continued to stare at the picture, but they don't look alike. Morrison met Jennifer's eyes. You're saying that this guy took over his identity? Jennifer nodded. Then who the hell are we looking for? Morrison asked. Jennifer glanced toward the windows at the far end of the department. I have no idea.